Hi there, and welcome to another episode of Teaching with Creativity. I'm your host, Susan Riley, and I'm the founder of EducationCloset.com, your digital hub for arts integration and STEAM. Today, we're gonna to be talking about how to utilize music as an integration point in your classrooms. Now, this little mini lesson idea is really great for two reasons. One, if you're a classroom teacher, this will get rid of that fear or anxiety that you have about using music. We know that music for arts integration and STEAM can often be a barrier for some teachers um, who feel as though they are not um, able to use music themselves, whether they feel like they can't sing or if they can't play an instrument or hold a beat. Lots of times music can be a barrier for classroom teachers because they're a little nervous about their own skills. Today's lesson is going to help you with that. And if you are a music educator, today's lesson is gonna allow you to take these kinds of concepts that you're already doing in your music classroom to the next level by integrating them with purpose um, through ELA, math, science, social studies. So if you are being asked to really think about arts integration and STEAM as a music educator, today's lesson is gonna help you as well. So in this lesson, I'm actually gonna give you five strategies that you can use um, in your own classroom at any time. And I really think that these are gonna help you really make music more accessible for you and your students, and they really are very low risk. So let's dive in. The first one that I'm gonna share with you is something I actually learned from a wonderful educator named Marcia Daft. She works with the Kennedy Center quite a bit, and she actually shared this at one of our online conferences, and I thought it was absolutely phenomenal. This works a lot of rhythm pieces in, but you can connect it to fractions and multiplication groups, and there's so many ways that you can use this. It's called meter against meter. So lots of times if we're looking at equivalent fractions in class, students really struggle with the idea of groupings, right? That they, it's hard for them to understand that a 12 could be grouped in groups of four, it could be grouped in groups of three or six or two. So to use this strategy, you would use a number line that has hash marks for each grouping. So you would start from zero and go to 12. And then if you wanted to do a group of four, you would have additional hash marks so that you had a group of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, so that you have those groups, one, four, eight, 12. And then you would do another number line right below that, again, zero to 12, but this time group it in threes. So a three hash mark, a six hash mark, a nine hash mark. So students can visually see that you're getting to the same destination, but you're doing so in a different way with a different set of groups. Then you have students create a beat pattern for each of those groupings that you have. So maybe for the group of four, it would be one, two, three, four. Sorry, let's switch that. One, two, three, four. That way we have a clap or something across the way. You can have them do a variety of different beat patterns. But what you wanna get them to end up at is that the last one has their hands coming up like this. So it could be one, two, three, four. Okay, one, two, three, four, whatever you'd like. Um, but they have that beat pattern that their hands are up on the uh, four, okay? So to keep working with them on that. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Then get them to do it to the count of 12. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So you have them counted out to 12. Once they get that, then they get to come up with a beat pattern for the other grouping. So a pair of three. And this one as well, you want them to end up with their hands up. Okay, so you might have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Once they have that grouping, then you go, you have half the class be a four group and the other half be a three group. Have them practice that individually. So if you're a four, you're gonna do that original four pattern. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And if you're the three, you'll do the one, two, three, four, five, six. So you practice your own individual group while the other one is happening on the other side of the room. 
Then you pair students together. A four group and a three group is a partner. And they count to 12 using their own beat pattern. This is gonna be a challenge for them, but once they do it a couple of times, they're gonna end up together on that, that clap, on that four, that, that three. When they finally get to the 12, they're gonna be able to hit hands together. Now you can do this with 10, you can do this with any number that you can divide um, into different groupings. So I love this strategy because first of all, it's a challenge for students. Secondly, it requires you to really understand beat patterns and meter. So you're really making sure that you're teaching the music concept with integrity and you're teaching the math concept with integrity. And that is the secret to really great arts integration and STEAM is that both subject areas are working simultaneously um, and with equity. So one is not in service of the other. Now, an extension of this is that around grade four or so, we'll start teaching students conducting patterns. So a four pattern would be one, two, three, four, and your hands come up, right? And a three pattern would be one, two, three, that triangle. So you can then extend this to from just a regular beat pattern to actual conducting patterns, and you can see how those patterns will match up and you can get more and more complex. So since we know that the um, a 12 can be divided by two and six as well, you could even have them do a, um, a six beat pattern or a two beat pattern as well. One, two, one, two, or you could do the six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, now obviously as a conductor, you're not necessarily gonna have your hands come up, but that way you transfer the idea across to each other from the beat pattern over to the conducting pattern. So it's a nice little extension piece as well. It also, because when you're conducting, it is a kinesthetic um, understanding of the concept because you have to have that beat in your body in order to conduct. It's really good to bring in that kinesthetic piece for those learners who need that movement piece. So. That is strategy number one. On to strategy number two. This one is called micro versus macro. So understanding how things are divided. So we could start with a macro beat. You're gonna start one, two, three, four. This is your macro beat. Now, this can be a challenge for a lot of students. You know, when you're at a concert and people start clapping along and suddenly it gets faster instead of really with the music itself, it's because people sometimes struggle with an internal beat. So keeping this in line, you have this big beat, big beat, big beat. Then you, you can see if you put your hand in between where the micro beat is gonna be. So if your hand is right in the center, you can see micro, micro, micro. You can split that big beat into micro, micro, micro. Two sounds for every one of the beat, okay? Now, lots of times students need this visual, but once you do that visual of the micro to the macro, then you can have them start using their words, okay? So, or sound, so that they can hear that the syllable that fits within that beat pattern. So if you have a beat, you can actually start using your sound. Micro, 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 micro. So you can hear how many sounds are in that main beat. You can continue to subdivide that. So instead of just a micro, 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 you can start having ticka, 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 ticka. That's four sounds. We've got a four syllable sound. Now, this is tying in with two distinct areas. First of all, definitely fractions. So understanding the whole and the parts and how every time you divide the parts equally, you get twice as many. So um, that understanding is really discrete understanding of the math mathematics concept. But there's also a literacy piece here that I hope that you're beginning to see in terms of um, syllables. So you can see how many syllables there are and you can start counting that. And what's great is that there is, if it's coming up on a holiday, like let's say Thanksgiving, you can actually assign words to this whole kind of beat structure. So if you wanted to start out with words, you could start out with something like corn, 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 turkey, 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 granny, 
granny apples, granny apples, granny apples, granny apples. And you can see how there's multiple syllables that you can do at one time. So you can actually have students layer those and create their own compositions, their own rhythm compositions based on the syllables that they're using to create a story around what they would eat at Thanksgiving dinner. So it is a really interesting way to use that concept of micro and macro beats, but also connecting it with math and with literature at the same time. All right, moving on. Strategy number three. Okay, strategy number three is something that a lot of folks like to start with, actually, with music because it's a little bit more passive instead of active in terms of musical instruction. And this is called responding to sound. So um, it's very similar to in visual art when we start integrating art by looking at a piece of artwork and visually seeing that and breaking down that um, what's inside of that piece of artwork. Um, you're not asking the students to directly create that artwork. Instead, you're asking them to analyze it. And for a lot of us as, as classroom teachers, that's more comfortable in an artistic medium where we might be a little bit more nervous. Now, that's not to say that it's not highly vigorous for our students. It really is. It is working those analytical muscles. So this is an important component as well. So in terms of responding to sound, um, there is a great connection that you can use actually with your visual art partner. Um, it's called synesthesia. And so several, lots of people um, have this. It's a, um, an anomaly, but it's wonderful. A famous artist who had this was Kandinsky. When you hear a tone, a specific musical tone or note, it actually triggers a color in your mind. So, you know, a, an A could, the musical note A could trigger a, the color yellow in your mind. Um, and so people, artists like Kandinsky would listen to music and then paint what they were hearing. Literally the colors that they were hearing and seeing in their mind would then transfer onto the painting. So you can do an exercise around this where you have students listen to the music and identify what kind of colors would this bring to mind? Why would those colors come to mind with that kind of music? And you can associate those colors. So something like green with envy, blue with sadness. Why do we connect those kinds of things? That is a literacy concept that many students struggle with because it is a little bit more abstract. And so tying it to music and being able to listen to something, how does that make you feel? What colors would you see? How would that then transfer to language um, is really important for students. So you could do an activity where they listen to a specific piece of music and then they come up with the colors that they would hear and they would paint to that piece of music. That's a great response piece or even designing a, a story around what you're hearing based on the music itself. So the dynamics, the instruments used, the timbre that's being used, the tone color, that kind of thing. You can utilize that in response to a piece of music. You can also utilize dance as a response to sound. So as you're listening to different pieces of music and you're going to want to select pieces that have highlights of this, like very short notes or very long drawn out phrases, you're going to want to pick music that highlights those kinds of um, experiences and then have students move the way that the music sounds. It sounds hokey. It sounds like, well, that's really, really easy. And it is really, really easy, except here's the thing. When you tie it back into vocabulary words that you want students to work on, it can be a very meaningful activity at the same time. So for example, if you know you have a students that are struggling with a set of vocabulary terms in your content area, like social studies unit or a math unit, one way that you could approach that is by identifying ways that you can move to a specific set of musical examples um, and use that vocabulary in your movement. So if I'm playing a piece of music, maybe something that is very calming because the words that we're, that we're identifying happen to be very calm words like gentle or soothing and what that means, I'm going to choose a piece of music that 
is gentle and soothing. If I'm picking something that's a little more aggressive, so words like um, volcanic ash, or I mean, something that is a higher level word that students really struggle with and that is more aggressive, you're gonna pick a more aggressive piece of music. Then you're gonna ask students, how would you move to demonstrate to me what volcanic ash is? Or how would you move to the word soothing? What would that look like with your body? Then turn on the music, and when you turn it off, have the call out one of the vocabulary words, like soothing, and they have to then move the way that they identified for that vocabulary word. This does a couple of things. First of all, it's tying the music in with dance in an incredibly beautiful way. Number two, it's also connecting those vocabulary terms and internalizing that both with auditory skills and with kinesthetic skills. So you're combining the two of them, which automatically brings up the vigor for your students. And it's really a way that they're going to use to remember what those terms mean in a much more meaningful way for them than just simply memorizing a new set of vocabulary terms. So I really love the idea of response to music. All right, let's move on to strategy number four. So this one is based on predicates and cadences. And I actually have a lesson that is developed that you can use for free on the site um, all about how to do this with predicates and cadences. So I'll link that in the show notes so that you can download that as well. With predicates and cadences, these are a really natural, elegant fit because a cadence in music is really how you close a musical phrase. Very often it comes down, so it, it naturally feels like the, the close of a phrase. Um, doesn't always, there's sometimes some surprises, but most times it does kind of fall down in terms of tone, and I'll give you an example in a minute. And a predicate in terms of sentence structure is a way to close a sentence, right? It's how you know that the sentence is done. And now sometimes when we're looking at standards to connect, the language standards, the convention standards are very challenging because they're kind of dry if we're thinking about this. You know, nouns and predicates and verbs and understanding what each of those are, it's pretty, you know, straightforward. So connecting with integration can sometimes be a challenge. However, predicates really do lend themselves very naturally because cadences do the exact same thing in music and it's very fun to be able to put the two of them together. So if I used a song like, to stop the train in cases of emergency, pull on the chain, pull on the chain, penalty for improper use, five pounds. You hear how the sound, penalty for improper use, five pounds, is make sure that the phrase is done, right? You wouldn't stop at, to stop the train, because that does not sound finished. So the cadence is what finishes that phrase. The same is true in a sentence. So the way that you would connect these two is by providing students with specific instruction on sentence structure and identifying those predicates. So you'd give them several sentences and determine where the predicate part of the sentence is. Then you would do the exact same thing with a song, like to stop the train in cases of emergency and have them raise their hand when they hear the cadence. And then we talk about the similarity between a cadence and a predicate. And then the activity would be that you could break apart the sentences and have students look at, okay, what part is the cadence or what part is the predicate and what part is the beginning and how do they match, match them up. So kind of like a shuffle and you match up the um, predicate to the remainder of the sentence. And then you do the same thing with the music. So we have a, and this one is a listening part. So you don't have to have them be reading the music. Although if they can, if that's something that was covered in their music class, it can be a great opportunity to reinforce that. Not necessary though. You can definitely do it with the listening component. So you can play phrases and then have them match them together, match the sounds together. That's very easily done in something like GarageBand or Audacity, both of which are free software tools that you can use. So again, you can pull these together. You could also have them create their own compositions. So have them create a composition with words that they could sing or perform or 
do whatever they want with, and then um, have them perform that in front of the class, and the class has to raise their hand when they hear the cadence and predicate come along. So again, a really fun way to combine the two, and you will find that lesson in today's show notes. All right, off to strategy number five. We're almost done, here we go. Okay, strategy number five is about exploring music. And this is something that we don't necessarily consider all the time, but it's really important. One of the things our students don't get enough experience in is in listening skills and in being a good audience. They honestly don't know how to be a good audience and how to actively listen to something. Listening is an incredibly difficult skill for students and for all of us, quite honestly. So students need practice in it. To do that, what I would recommend is actually playing a piece several times. The first time you listen to it as a whole and you give your general impression. The second time you listen to it, you're listening for something specific like a, an instrument that comes in or a, a volume change, which we call a dynamic change. Um, or something that's interesting that comes along that's different from the rest of the piece or maybe a surprise. Haydn's Surprise Symphony is a great uh, example of this that you could use. So have students listen for something that's surprising or that, ha that you're looking for specifically the second time that they listen to it. The third time that they listen to it and they know that that is coming, I want them to think about what would you change as a composer, if anything, if this was your piece? Would you change when that came in or what instrument plays there or would you keep it exactly the same? So this way they're really starting to think about it in terms of their own piece and then you can then move into, all right, I want us to practice that skill. And let's say it is looking at surprising an audience for taking Haydn's Surprise Symphony. How would you write a phrase or a composition, a piece of music? And it can be short. I mean, it can be like, you know, four measures long. It doesn't have to be long, but how would you insert a surprise somewhere in there? Would it be at the end? Would it be at the middle? Where would you put it? What would it sound like? And then give them the opportunity to do that. So they're moving from a passive listening to some experience to something that is very active to something that is creative and compositional and allows them to synthesize their learning and really make it their own. That is a wonderful way to practice experiencing music and then to tie it into audience, um, being able to be a good audience is to have students listen to those performances and offer feedback. So being able to quietly listen and not comment and not be picking at each other, you know, how students can do that sometimes, but then to also offer feedback, whether that's through applause, if it's after the piece is over, providing what you liked and what you thought maybe something could, that could be different, students need to practice that. So giving them that opportunity is also very helpful. I hope that these five strategies have made music a little bit easier for you as an integration point in your classroom. And if you're a music educator, I hope that this has spurred some new fresh ideas for how you can take these concepts to the next level in your classroom. For more ideas like this, please tune in to Teaching with Creativity right here on Education Closet. And if you feel like this is something that your friends and colleagues would benefit from, do be sure to share it. Don't forget to leave us a review over on iTunes as it really does help others find how to bring more creativity into their own classrooms. Thanks again so much for joining us and I'll see you next time right here on Teaching with Creativity. Looking to add more creativity to your classroom? Excited by the idea of arts integration, STEAM, and project-based learning, but not sure how to fit it into your busy curriculum? Try an online class from Education Closet. You'll receive a 10-hour PD certificate for each class that you complete. Each training is self-paced, includes lifetime access, and takes place in a modern video-based platform. You can use it on any device. You can learn anything from how to build a STEAM program to classroom management for hands-on learning experiences. It's your year to thrive, teachers. Visit educationcloset.com forward slash courses for more information and to get started today.